Hi. Yeah. In this video, I just want to summarize the entire neoclassical model and show you the structure of the equilibrium in this model. And look, I know at the moment it may not seem like this, but what we have been doing this far is that we have actually been the creating this very, very small and simple economy and we were analyzing parts of uh, this economy and what is happening in this economy. Okay, and look, in this economy we can distinguish four different types of agents. And look, uh, those agents are capital owners, laborers, producers of manufacturers, and producers of food. Now look, this is a functional distinction. What does it mean? That basically, each agent in this economy can uh, be engaged in, one, in at least one of these functions. Because look, we can actually imagine a person that is all four. That, that, is the kid, that this person, like let's just say she is a capital owner, she works for one of the companies and she also owns two companies, one that is producing manufacturers and one that is producing food. But from the functional perspective, it is insignificant. And what we are going to do now is that we are going to examine what types of relationships are connecting those four types of agents. Okay, so let's start with capital owners. Uh, what do capital owners do? Well, they rent uh, capital to producers of, uh, of manufacturers or to the producers uh, of food. So what they do actually is they provide capital services. Now, what are they getting in the return uh, from producers of manufacturers and producers of food? Well, they receive payment for this capital services and this payment is of course called Rent. And look, by the same token, we can see that laborers provide labor services for producers of manufacturers and producers of food. Now, what they are getting in return? Well, in return for their labor, they are receiving wage. Okay, and that actually this summarizes uh, the first type of the relationships between those agents. So on one hand, we see Factors of production providing their services to the companies that produce either manufacturers or food, and in return, they get either rent or wage. But this is, of course, not the only type of relationship that those two types of agents are getting into. Because, look, this, for now, we are assuming that there's no government. There is no savings and all other things that could just cloud our uh, uh, our analysis. But of course, producers of manufacturers and producers of food want to sell their products. To whom are they are they are selling them? To the customers. And look, from the perspective of our model, the customers are either the laborers or the capital owners. They are receiving income from labor and capital
capital services, and later he can spend this income on food and manufacturers. So look, on one hand, uh, producers of manufacturers uh, uh, deliver of manufacturers to the customers and of course they are not doing this uh, for free because then customers need to pay for those manufacturers so here we have spending on manufacturers actually at this moment we can even tell how much out of their income the customers will be spending on manufacturers I hope you remember that this is the delta M and this is this delta M that we take from utility function because with homotetic preferences it doesn't really matter what is the distribution of income in this economy because each customer spends exactly the same share of income on manufacturers and of course there is a second part over here producers of food provide customers with delivery of food while uh, customers are providing the producers with spending Producers 
maximize their profits. Again, where have we seen that? Look, in the previous video, we sh we seen production possibility frontier. How do producers uh, choose a point that maximizes their profit? Again, define a point on the production possibility frontier that is tangent to the price uh, of manufacturers to price of food ration. So again, we've introduced this in the into the economy. Then, condition number three is or all labor is employed. And of course, by we can get right away the second condition that all capital is used. Look, what does this, these two conditions are guaranteeing to us? Look, if we look at production possibility frontier, we want to be on production possibility frontier, right? If not all labor is employed or all capital is employed, it means we are somewhere over here below the production possibility frontier. And this is something that we don't, uh, that we don't want. Okay, so, uh, so finally, the last thing, uh, the, the last two conditions, are very simple, but those are the two conditions we haven't discussed that much. And those conditions are going like this. Supply of manufacturers must be equal to, uh, must be equal to demand for manufacturers. And condition number six, of course, in a similar way, supply of food must be equal to demand for food. And look, these last two conditions we will discuss in the next two videos. Uh, because those are a little bit more complex and uh, uh, so we need to spend a little bit more time on them. Although, intuitionally, and from everything you've learned about economics, and especially in your microeconomics classes, those two should be self-explanatory to you. Of course, we need to have uh, uh, we need to have an equilibrium in market for food and market for uh, in market uh, in for food and market for manufacturers, because otherwise, like we cannot establish equilibrium. Okay. And look, how are we going to proceed from now on? Look, when we were discussing the Ricardian model, what we started from was an outer key. What was outer key? That was closed economy that is not trading with the other economies. And we assumed that we have two economies like that. And we were seeing what is happening in those two economies. Now, from this moment, after that, we're going to move to full trade economy. What do I mean by full international trade economy? Is that those economies can actually trade with each other as much as they want. We are assuming away tariffs, uh, subsidies, everything that could distort trade. So there are no trade barriers. And what is more, we are assuming there is no trade cost. Uh, so basically, those economies start to function as one economy, of course, remember, only on the sides of products. We are still assuming that labor and capital that is located within one economy is completely immobile and cannot go to the other economy. So even though those economies can trade goods as much as they can, so as if they would be one economy, 
labor and capital cannot be lo uh, relocated between countries. Of course, within countries, it can be perfectly, it's perfectly mobile between the two sectors, but within countries. Between countries, it cannot move. Okay, and in the next video, we're going to start uh, with an outer key, and then we're going to move from outer key to uh, trading economy. Okay, see you in the next video.